a cloud to call his children. The dead in Christ shall rise to meet him in the air. And then those that remain shall be quickly changed at the midnight when Jesus comes again. Let's say amen again. Let's try to get it right tonight. Turn your eyes toward Jesus. <laughs> Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strange. in in the light of his glory and grace one more time turn your eyes upon jesus look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Father in heaven, I thank you for the presence of the Holy Spirit, and we ask in a special way, Lord, that you would be with us as we get ready to open your word. May angels flood this church. May you drive back the demonic forces that would not want us to see Jesus. And I pray, Lord, that there will be an ex a, a supernatural experience in our lives today and this Sabbath weekend that we will never be the same because of Jesus. Abide with us now, we pray, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Good evening and happy Sabbath. You know, when the sun set this evening, we move from common time to sacred time. We move to holy time, and so I say again, happy Sabbath, amen. I'm happy to be with us as we begin to study the word of God together. And I believe that this day that we're blessed to understand something about the seventh day Sabbath. This is a special day. Do you know that very soon, because of this day, we're going to see a crisis that's going to develop in the entire world that's going to decide the destiny of every soul living upon this earth. And it's going to show where our allegiance is. It's going to show whether we're loyal to God or whether we're loyal to man. It's going to show whether our service is serving self or Satan or sin, or whether we're serving, like Abraham, servants of the Most High, who have become the friend of Jesus. I want to be God's friend. What do you say? Now, my brothers and sisters, if you'll take your Bibles and turn to the book of Matthew, the second chapter. What book did I say? We're going to Matthew chapter 2. Tonight is Friday. 
we don't have much time left. Not just in the world, but I mean in this series. We only have tonight and all day tomorrow. That means that we don't have much time to try to bring out some final points and to bring some conclusion. And listen, we've only just scratched the surface of the truth for this time. And so we want to do by the grace of God. That means that tonight is going to be very serious. That means that we can have no distraction tonight. Please, if you have a cell phone, I want to remind you now. Sometimes we forget, but you don't have to forget to now. If you have a cell phone, cut it off. Or at the least, turn that thing to silence so it does not interrupt the presence of God. Amen. None of us have to be used by the enemy to be distracted. None of us want to be used. But none of us have to be negligent right now because I'm reminding us before we start. You see, the devil's afraid of what we're studying. Do you know that there's enough members and persons in this room tonight that can uh, cause his kingdom to be destroyed, entirely defeated? I'm not talking about just in Bethel or Asheville. I'm not talking about simply in North Carolina. There's enough people in this world to shake the world and turn it upside down. Or it could say right side up. And so my brothers and sisters, the devil's afraid. This is why I'm in no way concerned of the size of the church, small or large. But with the power of God, the world will be moved. But my brothers and sisters, this is why Satan is afraid. And this is why we can't do anything. In fact, if there's any talking tonight, I just want you to tap the person beside you. If he's talking, just say, shh, you didn't come here for that. You know, you can be all out of Asheville, you can be everywhere in North Carolina talking, but not in this church. We want to hear the voice of God, amen? It doesn't matter who we are, where we are, from the front to the back, we want nothing to distract us from the words of Jesus. There's nothing more important than this. Am I right or wrong? Because, brothers and sisters, we're getting ready to see, and I believe we've seen enough already to see, we're living in very solemn times. Right now and today, the condition of the church is in a condition that's most perilous. Inspiration tells us, in fact, I want you to look at the screen for a moment. I want us to see the screen. The inspiration tells us very carefully that there's something about the time in which we live that is very most perilous. I can see already the enemy is trying to attack. Do you have it ready for us, my friend? Is there is there anything that needs to be done uh, to bring it up? No, it's more serious than that. It's more serious than that. Do you, do you need my help back there? All right. Heavenly Father, I pray that you will remove anything that would try to stop us from being able to study your sacred word. That we can read its pages and understand exactly where we are in this earth history. I pray for the power of the indwelling Christ to be with us now as we study in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to come back there and just help you out, my friend. Would you sing, turn our eyes upon Jesus, please? God is good. Amen. I believe that this is the condition that the devil is afraid of and he doesn't want us to wake up because if somebody wakes up, he's in trouble. And so my brothers and sisters, this is why we must focus right now, because, see, we're talking about a time where there is a sleeping church right before our very eyes, a sleeping church. Now, is, is my is my thing in there? <laughs> All right. Let's read that. What did this say? What did this say? It says there is a sleeping church. Let's read that together. Volume 2, 205, it says, The Son of God went away the second time and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if this cup may not pass away from me except I drink it, thy will be. Now, you remember what this is talking about. Remember in Gethsemane when Jesus was getting ready to go through the crisis of the cross. It says, and again, he came to his disciples, and what were the conditions? He found them what? Sleeping. 
it says their eyes were not light, but their eyes were what? Heavy. And then the prophet says, by the sleeping disciples is represented a sleeping church. It is when the day of God's visitation is what? Nigh or near. It is a time of clouds and thick darkness when to be found asleep is most what? What does perilous mean? Talk to me, somebody. It means dangerous. Do you know that it is dangerous to be asleep right now? And God is saying, please, if we understand the seriousness of this time, we've got to wake up before it is everlasting too late. Now, if we want to understand what's getting ready to take place in these last days, we see that the greatest thing now is not to start dreaming, but the greatest thing now is to wake up. Amen? Now, my brother and sister, when we wake up, does that mean we're ready when we wake up? When we're awake, that doesn't mean we're ready. Can you imagine if you had to be at work at 9 o'clock in the morning? You woke up late somehow, got busy and uh, uh, stayed up so late, you woke up very late. You're supposed to be at work at 9 in the morning, and you wake up at 8.15. Someone says, well, I can just rush to work. So he says, you wake up at 8.15, there's some things you have to do before you're ready. Am I right? Now, one of the first things you got to do after you wake up, you got to spend some time with God. You know, it's dangerous to go out of the house and not spend time with Jesus. Can you imagine now, you wake up 8.15. It takes you 30 minutes to get to work. When you wake up, that means you have to do devotion. You have to brush your teeth. You have to wash your, your, your body. You got to put on your clothes. You got to get all the preparation, jump into the car, and you still have 30 minutes before you get there. Do you see that when you wake up, that's just the beginning? Do you know that even if we were to wake up as a church right now, we still would not be ready? That's just the first step. Now, my brothers and sisters, this is why inspiration tells us that it is most perilous not to know this, and the greatest thing we can do now is get to know God for ourselves. Now, last night, we found out a three-step plan, which I'm going to test you about it very quickly before we get ready to get back deeper into our study. Because the greatest thing we need to know is how to know God. Now, you remember that we said from the very first night, we laid down some practical principles of how to get to know God. And one of the first things we found, even before the three-step plan, if you're going to know God, we found out three words and one phrase. What is the phrase? It, it takes time. No one that does not give God time will get to know him. And so we saw saw then that there's an importance of understanding time. But even if we were to give God time, there's still some other things that need to take place. Now, we found out last night a three-step plan. We gave you the scripture for all of these steps. What was the first step? I'm testing you. What was the first step if we want to get to know God? What was the first step? Praise God. To know and what? Understand the time. What was the second step in that plan? Know what to do in the time. Now, is there a relationship between understanding the time and knowing what to do? Yes or no? We found out to everything there's a season and a time to every purpose under heaven that knowing the time is necessary to know what to do. How am I going to know to go to work if I don't know what time it is? You don't go to work at 3 a.m., not if you're working at a a job at 9 to 5. So the time stipulates what we do. Time regulates everything we do. So in order to know what to do, we must know the time. What text in the Bible shows us those two points? 1 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32. Everything you believe, make sure you got Bible for it. What was the third step? Once we understand the time, then we know what to do. Well, no, you don't just become his friend. There's something that happens. You remember, we found out that God's love is unconditional. You know that everyone in the world, God loves us. God so loved the world. Do you know that there's no sin that you can commit that could stop Jesus from loving you? There's nothing that I can do that could extinguish the love of God. Someone says, what about Satan? You know, God still loves Satan. Now, that loving is not going to prevent him from hellfire. In fact, the love is what is going to produce hellfire. He's going to put him out of his misery. But now, my brothers and sisters, we must understand love is unconditional, but friendship with God is conditional. How do I know that? Because Jesus Christ said himself in John 15. You remember that? Verse 14, he said, you are my friends 
It doesn't say no matter what you do. It says you are my friends. Then he gives that word. What? If. I think Jesus knows how to become his friend. What do you say? Someone says, the minister, well, it don't matter what you do. Well, it's better to ask Jesus than to ask a man. And Jesus said, if you want to be my friend, then you must do whatsoever I command you to do. Now, you know, God has given us some commands in diet and in dress and in music and in worship. And if we're not willing to do what he says, what we're really saying to God is that we don't really want to be your friend. Why call him Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? See, my brothers and sisters, the third step is to become his friend. We become it if we do by God's grace what he says. To know to do good and to do it not is sin, and sin doesn't bring us close to Jesus. Sin does what? Separates us from Christ. And this is why we need a CIP. A what? What did the C stand for? Close, the I, intimate, the P, personal relationship with Jesus. Do you want it, brothers and sisters? And that means that we need to start studying this time. So this is why we spend so much time studying in time. Now, what is the one that sets all three of these things in motion so we can become God's friend? What is the first step to begin setting all in motion? Talk to me, somebody. To know and understand the time. Is that how Jesus started his gospel when he started preaching? Yes or no? He said the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. He started here. So if we're going to follow Jesus, we must follow where he led the way. Now, if we start studying the time, we recognize that we're in a very solemn time. Every field of knowledge shows us that a crisis is coming, not just because we go to church. Do you know that persons who don't even go to church understand that a crisis is right now in America and around the world? Do you understand that? Every field of knowledge. Now, this is not accidental. You see, if you want to know what's going to happen before the second coming of Christ, all we have to do is look at what happened before the first coming of Christ. Remember the words of the wise man, Solomon, who said in Ecclesiastes, as it hath been, so shall it be. There is nothing new under the sun. What does he mean? In other words, history will be repeated. So if you want to understand the future, all you got to do is look at the past. If you want to understand what's going to happen at the second coming of Christ, all we have to do is look at what happened at his first advent. We are repeating the history of the Jewish nation. Now, I want to ask you a question. Did everybody in the church, were they aware of the first coming of Christ? They were not. In fact, the majority were not aware. Were the majority of the ministers preaching that Jesus was getting ready to come? The majority of the ministers at that time had no idea that Jesus was getting ready to make his advent. Were there a few ministers, yes or no? Praise the Lord. There were some God-fearing saints. There was still a minister who believed. He said, God told me that I was going to see the coming of Christ. You remember Simeon? You remember that? Any women? Yes or no? There was a woman right there. What was her name? Anna. There were some older saints that were still alive that recognized that the coming of the Lord was at hand. While the great majority of the ministry had forgotten it because they had been falsely educated in Greek education, they no longer understood the true message. It's amazing how history is repeating itself. But there were some common people that were studying the prophecies, those shepherds. But guess what? Do you know that there were some that others would have looked at and would have said they are not religious that knew that something was about to take place? Do you remember what they were called? Look at the map, look at the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter two. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. Matthew chapter two, beginning in verse one. Let's read it together. The Bible says, now when Jesus was what? Born in Bethlehem. Heavenly Father, please anoint your words. In Jesus' name, amen. It says, now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came, talk to me somebody. I'm going to write that on the board. There came what? Now, if they're wise men, what does that tell us about them? That tells us they're thinking or not thinking. These are thinking men and women. Am I right? Now, my brothers and sisters, the Bible says, now remember, history repeats itself. So the Bible says that not just the church, but there were those that were not a part of the church. That would not have been considered religious. 
that had an understanding through philosophy, through history, and looking at the harbingers or the signs that were in the heavens, and they recognized the greatest advent in human history was about to take place. The Bible says these wise men came from the east to Jerusalem, verse 2, saying, what are they asking? Where is he that is born king of the Jews? Why? They said, we saw something. We have seen evidence that the advent of Christ is near. Tell us, where is he? And you know what's amazing? That instead of the Jewish nation, instead of the seven Adventist church, instead of the people of God looking at that and saying, Lord, forgive us for being asleep. Now help us to get ready. Do you know how they responded? Because history repeats itself. What does the next verse say? The Bible goes on to say, in verse 3, when Herod the king, that was the political leaders, heard these things, he was what? Troubled, but not just the world was troubled. It says, and all Jerusalem, how much? You mean to tell me that the church was feeling just like the world? They were just as frightened. They were just as surprised as the rest of the political world was. Why? Because they had not studied the prophecies to understand the time. My brothers and sisters, the same thing is going on today. When the wise men, the thinking men tell us that the end of all things is at hand, we cry. These men are crazy. They're troubled. And then the seventh heaven is church. Instead of going back to the prophets, we take the same position and say, you know what? I'm troubled. I don't want to hear none of these things. But my brothers and sisters, you know what God is going to do? God is going to force us to go to the prophets. In fact, notice what the Bible says. Going on further. Look at what we should do. The Bible says in verse 4, and when he gathered all the chief priests and the scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. Verse 5, and they said unto him, where? Talk to me, somebody. In what? In Bethlehem of Judea. Now, how did they know the understanding or the answer to the problem? Look what it says. For thus, where? Talk to me. It is written, where? By the prophet. Now, I want to ask you a question. What they used to convince the world was not simply the evidence of the wise men. What they used to convince the world was the writing of the prophets. But I want you to understand that the wise man and the prophets came to the same conclusion. And whenever you see the thinking man and the prophets come to the same conclusion, you know that the event is about to take place. That's the way it was at the first coming of Christ. I wonder how shall it be at the second coming of Jesus Christ? Do you know that God has given us not only the ancient prophets, God has given us a modern prophet in the writings of the spirit of prophecy. And all of them are telling us the exact same thing. And guess what they're telling us as we go back to the screen? They're telling us that a crisis is coming to this world and in every field of knowledge, guess when the crisis is coming? You should know by now. Talk to me, somebody. Talk to me, somebody. You afraid to say it? That's all right. I'll say it for you. 2025 plus or. Now, why do I say plus or minus? Now, remember, God said no man can know the day and the hour before the close of probation. But he does tell us we can know the generation. And my brothers and sisters, we're going to see tonight. That the answer is 2025 plus or minus before this crisis develops in this world. What does plus mean? It could be a little bit more. What does minus mean? It could be a little bit less, but we're right in that time frame. Now, my brothers and sisters, you know what inspiration told us? It says this points out the work we're to do. The prophet quotes Revelation 7. Remember when the Bible says that the world was getting ready to be destroyed? And then it says that angels were standing on the four corners of the earth and they were saying, hold, 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 till the servants of God can be sealed. Therefore, remember that? Now watch what the prophet says concerning that in the book, volume five of the testimonies, volume five, page 717. Let's read this together. The prophet says, a vast what? Responsibility is devolving upon men and women of, are you a men and women of prayer? Yes or no? Well, we should be. Throughout the land to do what? Petition that, what does petition mean? Mean write down on the paper? What does petition mean? Pray. We're to pray that God will do what? Talk to me, somebody. Sweep back the clouds of evil and give a few more years of grace in which to, in which to watch television. In which to what? Work 
You mean to tell me that everybody in this church should be working for Jesus? Not just the pastor, not just the elder, not just the Bible. Some say, well, I have a Bible worker. Well, that, that's not enough. You know, every member of the church should be a Bible worker. Now, my brothers and sisters, what should we be praying for? What are those three words in red? What does the three words in red say? Now, somebody said, well, I want to pray for a few more years. I want Jesus to come right now. I'm going to tell you something. If you understand the work that has to be done, you would not be saying, let it happen right now. You'd be saying, Lord, give us a few more years of grace. Because we're not ready. The church is not ready. The world is not ready. And this is why we should be praying this. And if we understand that we are in 2025 minus right now as I speak, we'll be praying, Lord, give us a few more years. Now, though God can give us a few more years of grace, do you know there comes a point when God cannot give us anymore? You know, there, there's a such a thing called there is a what? Limit. You know what a limit is? What is a limit? This far and what? Now, do you know that it means that we don't understand what a limit is if we think that God can just keep giving us time. We're told that there comes a point where God can no longer delay his judgments. The mercy of God is extinguished and the judgment begins. And my brother and sister, I'm telling you that that is 2025 plus or. And that's why I'm praying, dear God. Please give us a few more years of grace. And I want to look at just a few evidence before we really stop. You know what that picture is? It's a, the artist's rendition of idea of Noah. Now I want to ask you a question. What do you notice about the ark? It's not finished. An ark wasn't built in a day. You know how long it took to build that ark? 120 years. Now, I'm going to tell you something. That's a symbol of the work of preparation. Do you know that the work of getting ready to meet Jesus does not happen in one day? Can you imagine if Noah had waited until the 120th year to start building the ark? If he had waited until the 120th year to start preparing, he would have waited too late. Do you know, brothers and sisters, that right now we have but a few more years left at the most. And we have not even really begun the work of preparation. This is why God is trying to tell us right now, we've got to do something now before it's too late. We're not even half awake. But if we realize the nearest of the events portrayed in the revelation, we're told a reformation will be wrought in our churches and many more will believe the message. We've looked at this. Now look at this evidence for a moment. I want us to look at this. Remember what the prophet says? Let's read this together. This, this should be etched in our mind as we are looking at what we're doing now. What the Bible says, this prophet says. Education 179, let's read that together. It, it says the present is a what? Time of overwhelming interest to how much? All living. Rulers and statesmen, men who occupy positions of what? Trust and authority. Now, circle that word. What word is that? Talk to me, somebody. Thinking men. Now, in the Bible, what were they called in the Bible? Talk to me. So it says, thinking men and women of all classes have their attention fixed where? Where? Upon the events taking place about us. They are watching the strain, restless relations that exist among the nations. Do we see that right now? Yes or no? It says, they observe the intensity that has taken possession, not just of some things, but has taken possession of how much? Every earthly element so the thinking men and women they can look at every earthly element and they can recognize something they recognize that something what great and decisive is not far away but by looking at the events of the earth they can look at every earthly element and they can recognize that these events are about to do what take place that the world is on the verge of a stupendous crisis so now these thinking men are not looking at the bible what are they looking at to know that the world is on the verge of a stupendous crisis? They're looking at every earthly element. Are you with me? So we should be able to look at the earthly elements and see that we're nearing this coming crisis. We should be able to look at every field of knowledge and get the crosshairs that allow us to see with accuracy exactly where we are in the history of the world. We should be able to look carefully, and as we look at it, we should be able to see for ourselves what's about to take place in this world history. Are you with me? Now, let's look at one of these things. Remember the one thing we, last night we started by seeing this. This says, the average empire, looking at the average empire, this says, the average empire this says, the average empire survives for how long? 250 years. And then we ask the question, is America at what? 
Now, we remember yesterday we talked about that when you study the history of empires from the world, not looking at the Bible only, just look at history. Now, when you do that, there was a man, there was a man by, uh, uh, by the name of, uh, 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 of Sir John Glib. Now, this man on Fox News looked at this and he wrote a book by the name of, uh, he wrote a book by the name of uh, America's Expiration Date and he said, will U.S. collapse by what? 2026. Now, what would make this man say that? That's the 250 year mark. By looking at the cycles of the earth, by looking at the 250 year mark, we can look at it and we can see it. This man talked about it. In fact, look what he says. It says, must, uh, must nations like library books be renewed if one wishes to keep it beyond the date stamped on the back? If you are too young to remember libraries and borrowing books, think of the date stamp on milk cartons, which indicates its sell-by date, beyond which the milk can turn what? You ever picked up a package and you saw an expiration date? You know there are a certain date by which it will spoil. The next the last paragraph says, in my new book, America's Expiration Date, The Fall of Empires and Superpowers and the Future of the United States, I examine eight empires that believe their economic strength and military power were enough to sustain them well into the future, and in the case of the Roman Empire, eternally, but all of them came to collapse. Now, interesting enough, when you study empire to empire, it says Sir John Glove calculated that the average empire and superpowers is what? 250 years. Then it says on July 4th, 2026, the United States will be how old? That means then if it has gone the way of the rest of the empire, that America by 2026 would have reached its expiration date and based on every other empire in the last 3,000 years, it will be time for America to collapse. But all that's saying is 2025 plus or minus. Now, that's history. Now, I'm going to now point to another, uh, another historian. I'm looking at the wise men for just a moment before we go to the prophets. Now, my brother and sister, there's something called the fourth turning. Let me see the hands of those who have ever heard of the fourth turning. Anybody know what the fourth turning is? The fourth turning is a book. A book. In fact, this says a book published how long? Nearly 25 years ago. talking about the 1990s. Predicted that America would hit a great crisis climax in around 2020. And that up next is a millennial versus boomer standoff that will usher in a new world order. This is a book written in the 1990s. Look what it says, a great crisis in 2008. In fact, it's interesting enough, you remember Pastor Mendenhall, we were at your church in 2008 talking about this. A great crisis in 2008 followed by an even greater crisis, greater one in what? Now the book wrote that in the 1990s. As an authoritative, severe, unyielding leader from the baby boomer generation, I wonder, well, I won't even say that. <laughs> Is this a historic moment of change of foot in the U.S.? It says, would you believe that this was all predicted almost what? 25 years ago in a book championed at the highest levels of the Trump administration. There were those in the Trump administration that talked about this book, the fourth turning, and used it as a playbook. There were those in the Democratic Party that did the same thing, both Democrats and Republicans looking at the same book. It was all predicted in 1997 in Neil Howe, William Strauss. Neil Howe, he went to Yale University, Berkeley University. William Strauss went to Harvard, these uh, great so-called universities that you trust in. It says the fourth turning, they wrote this book, and depending on who you ask, it was either a breakthrough in generational theory. Now look at what this says, and I want you to see something. This says... How and Straw saw the climax coming around 2020 and the resolution including a great devaluation as the economy is entirely restructured for a new set of circumstances around what year? Now, this is men not looking at the eight empires, not looking at all of the 3,000 years before. They're looking at a different set of history, but they're coming to the same conclusion. These thinking men now, I want you to see what they have studied and what they found for just a, a, a few moments. Now, my brothers and sisters, this book has attracted a bipartisan fan. In other words, no matter what your political persuasion, many have looked at this book and have saw what was taking place. Now, look at what they say. Now, this is what the book says. Sometime, it's quoting the book. It says, sometime before what year? 2025. They wrote, now, they wrote this in 1997. 
America will pass through a great gate in history and the very survival of the nation will feel at stake. These are these wise men, thinking men, historians were seeing all this. These thinking men. And guess what they found out as they began to start studying history? Guess what they found out? A radical theory says that major crises remake America. What? That's amazing. They studied through history. They're no longer looking at this historical understanding here, but they found out that through American history, a crisis has happened every what? Eight years. Now, do you know, brothers and sisters, that you can take, when did America declare independence? When did America declare independence? 1776. Now, I want you to see something. We're going to see, brothers and sisters, during when America declared independence, that you can trace the history in what is called 80 years of crisis. And I'll show you in a moment what they're talking about. Does life in America generally get better over time or does history really, what's the next word? Now, what did the wise men say? What did the Bible say? History does what? Repeats itself. Nothing new in the sun. More specifically, do horrible events keep plaguing the country every what? 80 years. You ever heard about a man by the name of Stephen, uh, Steph, uh, Stephen Bannett? Now, my brother and sister, amazing. Their predictions saw a major upheaval called, major upheaval called the fourth turning. Well, what do they mean by the fourth turning? I want to show you quickly. It says here, we're in the fourth turning. What do they mean? Let's read this together. What does it say? It says, picture America as a what? Suit iceberg floating in the ocean. 25% of the iceberg is where? Now, if I take 25%, how many 25% before I get the whole? How many? It takes four 25 percent to make a hole. Am I right? That's when he's talking about the four turnings. That there are four turnings in a hole. Now watch what it says. The other 75 percent of the iceberg is below the water, unseen and, known, and, and uh, unknowable. Every 80 years or so, a crisis occurs. The iceberg becomes unstable and it rotates. Our current 25 percent rolls into the water, and a new 25 percent surfaces. We adapt to a whole new America. Now. If this crisis happens 80, 80 years and we were to break it up into four parts, how many years would I have to do to break 80 up into four parts? How many years? So 20, 20, 20, 20. And what happens? 20, 40, 60, 80. So then this will be 25%, this will be 25%, this will be 25%, this will be 25%. So this is the first turning, second turning, third turning, and fourth turning. And they say every 80 years in the fourth turning, there's a crisis. Are you with me? It says, this crisis, last sentence of the first paragraph, this crisis is called a what? Fourth turning, and we are beginning one right now. Now, brothers and sisters, that means then that every time you come to the fourth turning, the last part of the 80 years, it's always a crisis. Now, my brothers and sisters, what I want us to do now is to then be able to begin to go back and actually look at this 80-year period. And I want to see, do you remember the last thing? I'm going to put it on the screen for a moment here. And look at what this says. This says, every 20 years or thereabout, the oldest generation dies, the new generation uh, uh, moved up on the elder midlife and young, and the newest generation is born. Each of the 20-year periods, Strauss and Howe call a what? Turning. In the first, second, and third turnings, life expectations change and social order realigns. But let's read that next sentence. The fourth turning is a what? Crisis. It occurs about every 80 years. Now, my brothers and sisters, America declared independence, but you're going to find out that a crisis began to start taking place. Now, we're going to find that in 1785, something was going on in America. Something was going on in America when you start studying American history. And all you got to do is just take some time to study it, and we're going to see it. Now, look what it says. America's first fourth turning occurred from what? 1773 to 1794. We started as an English colony, declared our independence, fought a war, and emerged in a new republic with a new government and a new constitution. Now, do you know that we reached the height of the American Revolution in 1785? We reached the height. I want to ask you a question. If we were to add 
80 years to that, what would you get if you added 80 years to 1785? What would you get if you added 80 years to that? Talk to me, somebody. You get 1865. Now, I want to ask you a question. Was anything happening in America in 1865? Yes or no? That's 80 years later. What was happening in America? I heard somebody say it. What was happening in America? Talk to me. The Civil War that almost divided this country in half. Almost destroyed America. Now, I want to ask you, 80 years later now, what is 80? If you add 18, 80 years to 1865, what do you get? They tell me in Asheville, you know math, so I'm going to test them tonight. I'm going to test you. What is 1865 plus 80? 1945, was anything happening in America in 1945? Talk to me, somebody. World War II. Now, my brothers and sisters, add 80 years to 1945. So now when you go through it, you must understand. In 2025, based on American history, and you can sum up American history in these four turns, and you will see every 80 years a crisis. Then, brothers and sisters, in American history, if this has happened for the last 320 years, why would it be any different this time? History is repeating itself. The wise men are telling us, now they don't know what the crisis is, but they recognize a crisis is coming inside of this fourth turning. And God is trying to tell us, please wake up, brothers and sisters. Look what it says. These wise men are looking. Every radical theory says a major crisis remakes America every 80 years. Now, my brothers and sisters, we see that happening right before our very eyes. The rising threat of what? Of a what? Civil war. Now, look at what it says. Look at the last paragraph. Let's read that together. It says, history is what? Seasonal. And winter is coming. Like nature's winter, the secular winter can come what? Early or late. I'm going to test you. What does that mean? Have you ever had a winter that came early and snow came before you thought? Have you ever had a winter that came late? What does that mean, then, if it can come early or late? What does that mean? Plus or minus. Now, my brothers and sisters, it says, even though it comes early or late, a fourth turning can be long and difficult, brief but severe, mild, but like winter, it cannot be what? In other words, we cannot get away from this crisis. It's coming. Brothers and sisters, they actually said what, what they believe. It says in that second paragraph, the very survival nation will feel at stake. This is what they wrote in 1997. Sometime before the year 2025, America will pass through a great gate in history. Commensurate, in other words, it will be similar with the American Revolution. And what else? What else? They said that what we're going to see as we approach 2025 is a crisis that was just like the Civil War. Now, my brothers and sisters, my question is, did the prophets tell us the same thing? Now, historically, guess what they believe? They believe that after the Civil War, it's going to start over again, and everything is going to go back to normal, and we're going to have a good life for another 80 years. What they don't recognize is that there is a limit. This is the last fourth turning. This crisis is going to bring the National Sunday Law. This crisis is going to bring the very thing that God told us would take place. And inspiration says in great controversy, again and again, the thought, almost the exact words of the sacred writer has been unconsciously employed by the orator and the historian. In describing the rise and growth of this nation, you go through the prophets and you see almost every word, almost everything we read in the Bible, the, almost the exact word is taking place. You know that the war in Ukraine happened on time? Look what the man says, the president, Zelensky. Look what the man said. Various Ukrainian cities have been attacked. Russia has turned the Ukrainian sky into a source of death for thousands. Russian troops have already nearly 1,000 missiles, uh, fired nearly 1,000 missiles, countless bombs. They use drones to kill us with precision. Now let's read the next sentence together. This is a terror that Europe has not seen for what? 80 years. But remember now, every 80 years, what takes place? A crisis. This is no ordinary crisis taking place in Ukraine. It's not going to disappear. It's going to get worse, worse, my brothers and sisters. We're going to find that something happened there, and these thinking men are showing us what is right before our very eyes. The prophet said, look what the prophet says. The prophet said, told us the very thing that, that right there, looking at the very thing, we see the exact same thing happening right before our very eyes. Look what it says.
This is. Twenty twenty five. The year mankind hits the what? Of no return. I turn from the source of history. It says a chilling new report suggests that the earth may soon hit a tipping point that will do irreparable damage to what? The planet's ecosystem. Now, my brother and sister, I want us to see something. That whether you're studying history or science, whether you're studying economy, whether you're studying anthropology, whatever, no matter what the field of knowledge, how are they all coming to the same place? 2025, plus or minus, is the time. Now, my brothers and sisters, you know what that tells us? That tells us if ever there was a time to get ready, the time is when? It's right now. It will take a divine miracle to reach to 2025. You saw scientists all coming together. It says the most important news of 2020, 2012. This was written in, uh, in 2015, talking about what happened in 2012. It says there was a chilling uh, 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 report. And it says uh, it, it will concern a sprawling new report in the journal Nature. Look at the last paragraph. The argument goes that human, humans have already converted roughly 43% of the planet's usable land area into farms and livestock ranches and cities. As many studies have already suggested, when more than 50% of our natural landscape is lost, the ecolo ecological web that sustains humanity will do what? Collapse. Now, my brother and sister, you know what they found? That as of 2023, we are almost past that very point of 50%. This is why when they looked at nature, it proved it. It proved on the that last paragraph says a team of 22 scientists from the Berkeley uh, Initiative in Global Change Biology assembled the study in preparation for the Rio 20 Global Sustainability Summit that was this week. The expectations for the gathering are low, but many environmental groups are pushing for action. But at the original meeting 20 years ago, world leaders failed to meet even a fraction of the promises. And what those scientists put together when they saw this report, they saw that by the year 2025, that the earth could no longer even sustain us, that something is happening. Now, I'm going to tell you something, brothers and sisters, tomorrow we're going to find out that this has something to do with the end of the Day of Atonement. We're going to find out that this is the condition the earth must be in before the Day of Atonement comes to an end. And everything is pointing to this generation. My brothers and sisters, I think that we need to wake up. What do you say? Let's stop right here. As we go into the heart of our study to begin to really understand this from the word of God, would you reverently kneel with me as we approach the Lord in prayer? Heavenly Father, the handwriting is on the wall. And many, many to tackle your forest, and it's not written simply for Babylon. It's written for the United States of America and the entire world, that the world's limit has come to an end. And that, Father, if ever there was a time to wake up, it's now. The wise men have come to Jerusalem. The wise men have come to the Seventh Adventist Church. The wise men have come to the scene. And, Lord, we're to go back to the prophets, to the Bible, to confirm, is these things so? And Lord, we beg of you. Because in order for it to do for us what it must, we must be willing to surrender everything that we can become one with Jesus Christ. Father, tonight we must make a decision in our mind that there's going to be radical changes. That I will not go on living life as normal. That we will spend more time in prayer and study and surrender and witnessing and doing whatever is possible to get ready and to help as many as we can before it is everlasting too late. And so, Father, as we go deep into your word, I pray that you remove me. I'm fickle, I'm fevered, I'm frail. Speak to us tonight. I pray that you'll be with the feeble equipment, that it will be able to work to allow us to see the handwriting on the wall as we study the Bible together so that, Father, we can turn our eyes upon Jesus. Abide with us now, remove every distraction, for we ask it all in the worthy name of Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. If you'll take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Romans, chapter 13. What book did I say? We're going to the book of Romans, chapter 13, and we want to notice what the Bible says as we turn to the book of Romans, chapter 13. As we have studied together for the last few nights, 
I believe that we can see from the word of God with prophetic clarity that we're not living in any ordinary times. I believe that it's very evident to us that the time in which we live is both solemn and significant. We're living not at the beginning of the world. We're living in the last days of this earth's history. My brothers and sisters, we prove from the word of God that this generation shall not pass. Why? Because this generation is the boundary generation. This generation is the limit generation. This generation is the last generation. This generation is the final generation. And whatever we do for the master, we must do quickly. In fact, the Bible says in Romans chapter 13, beginning in verse 11, you're there, amen? Let's read that together. What does the Bible say in verse 11? The Bible says, and that what, everybody? And that knowing the time, why? That now it is high time to awake out of sleep, why? For now is our salvation nearer than what? When we have what? When we believe. The Bible says in verse 12, the night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of what? God says, please, if we see that we're sleeping right now, it must mean that we must wake up so that we can get ready before time runs out. Remember we read yesterday a prophet uh, where the prophet wrote, the prophet says, I saw that the remnant were not prepared for what was coming upon the earth. Remember we read that? The prophet said very carefully. I saw that the remnant were not prepared for what was coming upon the earth. Stupidity like lethargy seemed to hang upon the minds of most of those who professed to believe that we were having the last message. And then the prophet said this. Let's read this together. It says, my company angel cried out how? With awful solemnity. What did she say? Get ready, get ready, get ready. For the fierce anger of the Lord is soon to come. His wrath is to be poured out, unmixed with mercy, and you are not ready. Rend the heart and what? Not the garment. A great work must be done for who? Not just the world. A great work must be done for the remnant, and that's you and me. You see, brothers and sisters, God is trying to impress us tonight to embrace the spirit of urgency. We must make haste to get all things ready for the crisis. You know, when you study the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, Every true person of God had a spirit of urgency. You'll find that every true child of God had a spirit of urgency. In fact, in Lift Them Up 180, it says, we must talk the truth in private and in public, presenting every argument, urging every motive of infinite weight to draw men to the Savior, uplifted on the cruel cross. God desires how many? Every man to attain into eternal life. It says, mark how all through the word of God, there is manifest, what everybody, the what? Spirit of what? urgency. You can study from Genesis to the book of Revelation. You will find, brothers and sisters, that every true child of God has had the spirit of urgency. But there was one person who stands above every other that was more urgent than anyone else from Genesis to Revelation. What was his name? Jesus. My brothers and sisters, Jesus had a spirit of urgency because he understood the time in which he was living. He understood the great clock of time and the truth of this time and the same spirit of urgency that was in the life and ministry of Jesus. It must be in his followers today. In fact, notice what the Bible says in John. What book did I say? We're going to John chapter 9. Notice what the Bible says in John chapter 9. The Bible is very clear. Jesus was very urgent. In fact, in John chapter 9, you remember we left off last night talking in verse 4. The Bible said in John chapter 9 and verse 4. Let's read that together. The Bible says, I must what? Work the works of him that sent me when, while it is day. Why? For the night cometh when no man can what? Jesus was urgent because he knew there was going to come a time when no more work for redemption or salvation could take place. And so Jesus was about the business with the spirit of urgency. Do you want that same spirit, yes or no? Now, my brothers and sisters, that spirit of urgency, God wants to be in every one of us. Now, I want to do a quick review to try to see if you remember what we studied last night. Question. We know Jesus had a spirit of, urgent, spirit of urgency, but my question is, why did Jesus have a spirit of urgency? Talk to me, somebody. Why? He understood the time. He knew there was a what? What did he know? There was a what? By understanding the time, he recognized that there was a limit. He recognized that. Now, what was Jesus studying? That let him know that did he know there was a limit because he was an infinite God? Is that how he knew? In his humanity, he learned the same way that you and I can learn. What was it that Jesus studied to let him know that there was a limit? Talk to me, somebody. What did he study? He studied the great clock of time. Now, how did Jesus himself know that great clock of time? How did he know that great clock of time? Talk to me. 
I heard somebody whisper it. He studied the what? He studied the sanctuary. Now, my brother and sister, inside of the sanctuary, what did he look at inside of that sanctuary that let him know that there was an exact time? Because remember, we found out last night that Jesus knew the year he was going to die. Did he know the day he was going to die? Did he know he was going to die on Friday? Did he know the hour he was going to die at 3 p.m.? Now, how did Jesus know the year, the day, and the hour that he was going to die? It was braced on this great clock of time found in the sanctuary. And my brothers and sisters, what was he studying in that sanctuary that let him know it? What was he studying? Talk to me. He was studying the feast, the type, and the first type he was studying was what? Was what? Passover. Now, where in the Bible shows us that it was the study of the Passover that let Jesus know the day he was going to die? Where would you go in the Bible to, to see that? Now, Leviticus 23 tells us the date of the Passover. What was the date of the Passover? The, what, did, the Passover ha, did the Passover happen at any date, or did it happen on a specific season or time? What was the date of the Passover? The 14th day of the first month. Am I right? Now, I want to ask you a question. Where in the Bible would I go to see that Jesus knew he was going to die on that day based on that? You can't go to the Old Testament because you, that would only be confirmed in the New Testament. Now, in the Old Testament, it told us today in type. How do we know that Jesus knew the anti-type, that that was exactly when he was going to die on the cross in 31 AD? Go to Matthew 26. Go to Matthew 26. You remember that as we studied the life of Christ, we found that many times people tried to kill Jesus. But he said, my time is what? Not yet. You can't touch me. There are 12 hours in a day. In other words, I'm going to die on time. We looked at that. Then we saw in Matthew 26, but there came a time when he no longer said, my time is not yet. In Matthew 26, notice what the Bible says beginning in verse 18. We didn't look at this verse last night, but I want to look at it tonight. Look at Matthew 26, beginning in verse 18. Are you there? Amen. Let's read verse 18 together. The Bible says, and he said, go into the city to such a man and say unto him, the master saith, my time is not yet. Is that what it says? What does the Bible say? He said, the master said, my time is at hand. Now, why did he say it? Because he said, I will what? Keep the Passover at thy house with what? What let Jesus know that the time of his death was at hand was he understood type and any type in the sanctuary as he studied the Passover. In fact, in verse 2, look at the words of Jesus in Matthew 26, verse 2. You see the exact application. In Matthew 26, verse 2, the Bible says, let's read that together. It says, you know. That after two days, don't guess this, you know this, that after two days is the feast of what? Again and again, he points to the same thing. It's the feast of the Passover, and the Son of Man is betrayed to be what? So Jesus knew the date of his death and crucifixion as the Lamb of God because he studied type and any type, the shadows of the sanctuary, and Passover was number one. Is that clear from the Bible, yes or no? That means that the very day that Jesus died in 31 A.D. was the very day that the Passover lamb was slain for over 1,500 years. We saw, brothers and sisters, as they looked at the types and the shadows, it meant something. The slaying of the Passover lamb was a what? Was a what? Shadow. Great Controversy 399 says, these types were fulfilled. Now, let me test you. Let me test you. Let me test you. We found out last night that these types and shadows were fulfilled in two ways. I wrote them on the board two ways. How were they fulfilled? What were the two ways? They were fulfilled as to the, as to the event, very good. And it was fulfilled as to, the, as to the type. In other words, if the type said that the lamb was going to die, that's the event. So whoever the lamb represented would have to die. But it's not only the event, but the shadow actually specified the time. So my brothers and sisters, this says, these types were fulfilled not only as to the event, but as to the. So that means that every prophecy, every type relating to the first event happened on time. Unleavened bread happened on time. First fruits happened on time. Pentecost happened on time. Now, my question is, did that clock break and stop in 31 AD? Yes or no? That clock, which started at Passover, was just the beginning. But how many feasts was in that shadowy service of the sanctuary? How many feasts takes us from beginning to end? How many? Now, seven. Now, brothers and sisters, in the Bible, seven is a very special number. The Bible is built on seven. The plan of redemption is built on seven. The sanctuary is built on seven. 
The book of Revelation is built on seven. My, my brothers and sisters, seven is an ordinal number for God. Now, what were those seven feasts? I'm testing you again from Leviticus 23. I told you you could retake the homework. Amen. First feast. What is it called? Passover. What day? 14th day of the first month. Amen. Second feast. No, don't look back at your paper now. No, no, no. I didn't say this was an open book test. <laughs> now, it's all right. You can look back at your notes. It's okay. <laughs> the second feast is the feast of what? Unleavened bread. What day? 15th day of the first month. Third feast was the feast of what? First fruits. What was the date of the feast of first fruits? 16th day of the first month. Now, do you know that all of this happened on time? The unleavened bread, Jesus was in the grave resting on time. 16 first fruits, Jesus was offered the first fruit in heaven. 16. Now, what was the fourth feast? What was the fourth feast? Talk to me, somebody. The Feast of Pentecost. Do you know that the Feast of Pentecost happened? See, when you study this, then all the Bible starts making sense. Do you remember in the book of Acts when it started off, Jesus came back after his death, after his resurrection, and he stayed with the disciples when we read Acts for 40 days. That's what the Bible says. Now, you know what the word Pentecost means? It means 50. 50 days after the first fruits was the day of Pentecost. And do you know that Pentecost happened on time? What was the fifth feast called? What was the fifth feast called? There was a long break after Pentecost and then the Feast of Trumpets. What month was the Feast of, uh, was the feast, of Pentecost, uh, feast of Trumpets? Remember, God finishes everything in sevens. Feast of Trumpets was the seventh month. What day? What day? The first day of the month. And it went for 10 days. Now, my brothers and sisters, then we come to the sixth feast. What was the sixth feast called? Every seven of minutes should be able to tell me this. What was the sixth feast called? Talk to me, somebody. The day of atonement in which the sanctuary was cleansed. What was the date of the day of atonement? What was the date of that day? The 10th day of the seventh month was the day of atonement. Now, do you know, brothers and sisters, that this is how the early Adventists understood when Jesus went into the most holy place. This is how they could say not only 1844, but they were able to say what? October what? Because in 1844, October 22nd was the 10th day of the seventh month. It happened on time. Now, my brothers and sisters, but that's not the end of that clock. The seventh and final feast was a feast called the Feast of what? The Feast of Tabernacles. Now, my brothers and sisters, you remember that we have the first six down here, but then we have it separated and the seventh up there. Tell me why I didn't put all seven together. Why do we put one six down there and then separate it and have the seven at the top? Why? Praise God. The first six feasts happen on earth, and the seventh and final feast doesn't happen on earth. It happens where? In heaven, and it's called the Feast of, you know, the Feast of Tabernacles was a celebration of the sojourn of the children of Israel from Egypt to the Canaan land. After they made it into the promised land, they were celebrating their sojourn through the wilderness of sin. When we get to heaven, there's going to be a great feast, a great welcome table, miles and miles long, and we're going to celebrate that journey we had on earth from Egypt to Canaan or from sin to redemption, and we're going to celebrate it. Guess how long we're going to celebrate it? Talk to me, somebody. A thousand years. When that thousand-year period is over, we're going to come back to this earth, and Eden lost is going to become Eden re uh, restored. But now I want you to notice this interesting statement. Now, the first feast that related to the first advent of Christ, they were fulfilled as to the time and as to the event. Am I right? Now, watch what the prophet says concerning these feasts. Watch what the prophet says. Let's read together. It says, in what? What does like matter mean? Same way, just as the first four feasts happened relating to the first coming of Christ as to the time and event, it says, in like manner, the types of which relate to the second advent, not might, but what? Must be fulfilled when? At the time pointed out where? In the symbolic service. So the prophet said, just as the Passover was fulfilled on time, and the first fruits on time, unleavened bread on time, Pentecost on time, those were all events relating to the first advent. That's why you had them, and then a long break. The last three feasts, Trumpets and atonement and the tabernacles relate to the 
second advent. And the prophet says these types which relate to the second advent must be fulfilled at the time. That means then that these last feasts must happen on, did the day of atonement happen on time, yes or no? So Jesus then was born on time. He died on time. He resurrected on time. He went into the holy place on October 22nd, 1844. He went into the most holy place on, and guess what? Jesus will come back on, that's what the great clock of time says. Now, my brothers and sisters, do you know that in order for this to happen on time, the sixth feast has to end on time in order for the seventh feast to end on time? Are you understand what I'm telling you? Now, look at what this says. Question. What event relates to the second advent of Christ? Now, look what the quotation says. I want to make sure you understand what this says before we look at that. In like manner, the types which relate to the what? Second advent must be fulfilled. Now, question. On the Day of Atonement, when did the second coming of Christ happen in type? You remember in, 18, remember in, the, in Leviticus when you read chapter 16 for homework? Uh-oh. When you read Leviticus 16 for homework, for homework, the priest at the beginning of the day goes what? He does what on the Day of Atonement? On the beginning of the day, he goes what? He goes inside the most holy place. Am I right? And what's he trying to do inside that most holy place? He's doing the cleansing of the. But at the end of the day of atonement, he doesn't stay in. At the end of the day of atonement, he comes where? Now, I want to ask you a question. If the outer court represents the earth. And the sanctuary represents what happens in heaven. Then when he leaves the most holy place in the sanctuary to come to the outer court at the end of the day of atonement, that would be a type of what? The second advent of Jesus Christ. So at the end of the day of atonement is typifying the second advent of Christ. You understand what I'm telling you? Now watch what the prophet says, though. In like manner, the types which relate to the second advent must be fulfilled at the time pointed out in the symbolic service. So that means that Christ must leave the most holy place on time. Now I want to ask you a question. In 2023, how long has Jesus been inside the most holy place? You know, brethren, since he went in 1844, am I right? We're in 2023. How much time is it from 1844 to 2023? That's 179 years. Now, that's going to be on the test. Later, a little later on, we'll come back and put that on the test. You know how a teacher, a good teacher will tell you, that's going to be on the test. That's going to be on the test right there. Write that down. That's going to be on the test. We're coming back to that because we're going to find out that Jesus has to leave the most holy place on. Now, what we have to find out, what is the time for Christ to leave the symbolic service on the day of atonement? Now, let me tell you something. You know, he could cut the time short. You know that, right? But there's a limit beyond which he cannot go beyond. He can come before, but not after. So my brothers and sisters, we want to find out what is the limit of how long he can be in that most holy place. How much time can he be in there? Let's go a little further. We'll see from the symbolic service because it must happen on time. We are right now in 2023 between the sixth feast and the seventh feast, and they have to end on time. Are you following me? Let's see if we can find out. Now, what we're getting ready to do is we're getting ready to follow the shadows because inspiration says that we don't have to guess at anything. Surely the Lord God will do nothing but reveal his secret to his servants, the prophets. Now, look at the shadow. Now, anything that happens in, 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 with a real hand, now look on the board for an example. If, if you look at the board, you see a shadow. And what is the shadow doing? What is the shadow doing? Now, why is the shadow moving? Because I am literally moving. The shadow is the type. My hand is the antitype. So I can know, even if you couldn't see my hand, you can know what my real hand is doing by looking at the what? Are you with me? I want you to look at the shadow for a moment because we're going to find out that in the sanctuary, it shows this shadow. Are you looking at the shadow? Now, look at where the shadow stands. What does it say up there? It says first generation. You see that? Now, at the end, what do we see at the end? What do we see at the end? Final generation. Now, what we're getting ready to do is be able to show how the shadow of the sanctuary is going to show us that we're in the final generation. Now, I want you to look at the shadow, and I want you to tell me when I get to the final generation without guessing. Are you ready? I heard one man say he's ready. Amen. <laughs> Watch the shadow. Are you watching? Are we at the final generation? Are you sure? Are we in the final generation? Are you sure? How do you know? Because the shadow 
has not pointed it out. Are you with me? Are we in the final generation yet? Are we getting closer? Are we approaching, getting nearer? Are we at the final generation yet? What about now? Are you guessing? Now, you can look at the shadow and determine where we are by watching the shadow. Six on earth, and then the last shadow will take us where? Where will the last shadow take us? Talking to me somewhere. In heaven. Now, you know the sixth shadow has a limit by when it, when it must end. The sixth feast, and it's the easy way to remember it. The sixth feast has a limit of 6,000 years. Look what the prophet says. Page and Prophets, page 342. Let's read it together. It says, the great what? Plan of redemption results in fully bringing back the world, not just uh, 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 the person, but even the earth itself. Sin destroyed this earth, but God's going to have a new heaven and a new earth. Are you with me? The great plan of redemption results in fully bringing back the world into God's favor. All that was lost by sin is what? Restored. Not only man, but the earth is redeemed. To be the eternal abode of the obedient. Well, how long is the earth going to be under Satan's uh, 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 control? Look what it says. For 6,000 years, Satan has struggled to maintain what? Possession of the earth. Now, God's original purpose in his creation is what? Accomplished. The saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and, e and ever. Patriots and Prophets 342. Question. How long will the devil be able to hold control of the earth? And what was the limit of when God would break his control over the earth? Talk to me, somebody. 6,000 years. That tells me then that the limit of how long we're going to be on this earth is 6,000 years. And then in heaven, how long in heaven? How long in heaven? 1,000. Now, 6,000 plus 1,000 equals what? 7,000, which is the history of the whole plan of redemption. It's broken up in six and one. The Day of Atonement, then, has to end on time for all of this to be finished in 7,000 years. Are you following what I'm saying? Now, my brothers and sisters, that means that if you look at the sanctuary, then you see it all laid out. It makes sense what's going on. Now, what we're getting ready to do is go to the Bible. Does the Bible tell us the same thing? The prophet, the modern prophet says that. Does the Bible tell us the same thing, yes or no? We're going to find that the Bible itself gives the exact same truth. In fact, go in your Bible right now. Go in your Bible. As we go in the Bible, we want to see this from the Bible itself to Isaiah chapter 46. What book did I say? We're going to Isaiah 46. We're going to bear this out from the Bible. Everything that prophet says, the Bible says. We're going to Isaiah 46. Isaiah 46. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. Isaiah chapter 46. Notice what the Bible says beginning in verse 9. Isaiah chapter 46 beginning in verse 9. You're there, amen? Let's read that together. What does the Bible say in verse 9? The Bible says, remember the... Former things of old. For I am God and there is what? None else. I am God and there is what? None like what? None like me. Verse 10. Declaring the end from the beginning and from the ancient times things that are not yet done saying my counsel shall stand and I will do how much? Now what I want to do, I want to show us that exactly what this prophet says, God says. That the prophet says for 6,000 years, Satan's work. We're just going to take our time and go through. Look what it says. It says, going on, for 6,000 years, Satan's work of rebellion has made the earth to do what? Tremble. He had made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof. He opened not the house of his prisoners for 6,000 years. His prison house had received God's people and he would have held them captive forever. But then it says, but Christ had broken his bonds and then what? Set the prisoners free. We saw last night that the prison house was what? What did the prison house represent? The grave. We saw at the second coming of Christ, he's going to break the prison house by allowing the resurrection to take place. The dead in Christ shall rise. We shall be with the Lord for a thousand years. Then it says, for a thousand years, Satan will wander to and fro in the depths of the earth to behold the results of the rebellion against the law of God. During this time, his sufferings are intense. We found out that 6,000 plus 1,000 equals what? 7,000. We see that the prophet is clear. Does the Bible bear out the same thing? Now, the Bible says in Isaiah 46, you remember what it says? There's nobody like God. Verse 10 says, declaring the end when? 
So we can expect, if we want to understand the end of time, all we got to do is look at the beginning of time. We can understand how time is going to end just by going to the beginning and looking how it was at the very beginning. There's something about the beginning of time that tells me the end of time. Why? Because God declares the end from the, how did God start time? Because that's how he's going to end time. Question, how did God start time? With 10 days? With 12 days? Or with seven days? Go to Genesis chapter 1. Go to Genesis chapter 1. God declares the end from the beginning. If we want to understand the end of time, all we got to do is look at the beginning of time. Every book in the Bible is explaining this plan of redemption. In Genesis 1, you know the story. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And verse 3 says, and God said, let there be light, and there was. And then verse 5 says, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the, God starts day one, and then day two, and then day three. Question. Does that week go on forever, or is there a limit to that week, yes or no? There's a limit to that week. In fact, what number is attached to the limit boundary end of that week? What number is, talk, is attached to it? In fact, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 1, the Bible says, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them, verse 7 says, And on the seventh day God, what's that word? Ended his work which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. Verse 3, and God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work, which God created and made. Again, we see that in the beginning of time, God came back to this number set. God is declaring the end from the, he's saying, just as you have seen seven days in which I have created this world, I'm going to show you that in seven days, all of it is going to come to an end, not only in creation, but we're going to see it somehow in the plan of redemption. God finishes everything in seven. Now, my brothers and sisters, is those, are those seven days all in one lump, or is there a division of six and one? Now, do you know when you go to the Ten Commandments, we see a division of six and one? How do I know? Go to Exodus now. Exodus chapter 20. In Exodus chapter 20, we see a division of 6 and 1 right in the heart of the law of God. Notice what the Bible says in Exodus 20. And you're going to see it's not accidental that God called us Seventh-day Adventists the last church or the limit church that he's going to use in the last hour of human history. Look what the Bible says in Exodus chapter 20. Looking at the fourth commandment beginning in verse 8, you could say it from memory, but I want you to read it from the Bible because we're looking at something very deep. Look what the Bible says in Exodus 20 beginning in verse 8. Are you there? Amen. Let's read verse 8 together. What does the Bible say? It says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and what? Now notice it's breaking the seven into two parts. So now it's showing, now it's showing that this seven is going to be broken up into two parts. What is the two parts? Talk to me, somebody. Six days. We do all thy work. And then that last day, that one, is a Sabbath in which there's going to be what? There's going to be what? It's going to be a Sabbath of rest. Six days shall I labor no other work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do what? Any work. Now, my brothers and sisters, I want to ask you a question. As we look at this week, is it, does God want us to work on the seventh day, yes or no? He wants us to rest. Am I right? So God was setting up a, a type for us to understand something. Now, do you know that when you look at this, all we got to do now is find out to God, what is a day like with God? Because, see, man has six days to do all of his work and only one day in which to what? Rest. So what we have to do now is find out how much time does God himself have? And all we got to do is look at man. Because man was made in the image of. So how much time was man given to do his work? How much time was man given? Six days of work, one day of rest. And man was made in the image of God so that we could actually see if you want to know how much time God has. All you have to do is look at how much time man has. And man has six days to do work and one day to rest, and it's repeated over and over again trying to teach us this lesson. 
So someone says, does God only have six days? Well, you got to understand, God is much bigger than man. And so God's days are reckoned much different than our days. So if we could find out from the Bible how many days that it, what, day, what a man, a literal man day is like with God, we could understand how much time God has. Do you understand what I'm saying? Does the Bible tell us yes or no? Let's go in the Bible to 2 Peter. What book did I say? Go to 2 Peter chapter 3. And notice that the Bible lays out what a day is like with the Lord. In 2 Peter chapter 3, notice what the Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 3, beginning in verse 3. God takes us back to the very beginning. He declares the end from the beginning. At the beginning of time, he gave man seven days. We saw that those seven days were broken up into two parts, six days for work, one day for rest. Someone says, well, that was man. But the Bible says man was made in the image of God, just as man was given six days for work and one day for rest, God in man, uh, the, the God has been given six days of work and one day of rest in the plan of redemption. Now, my brothers and sisters, but God's day is different from our day. Notice what the Bible says in 2 Peter 3, beginning in verse 3. You're there, amen? Let's read verse 3 together. The Bible says, knowing this verse, that there shall come in the last days, what? Scoffers walking after their own lusts. Verse 4. And saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were when from the. So he said there's going to come in the last days. People say, oh, no. Do you know that God said he was going to come, but he never came? You know how many people say, oh, Jesus said he was going to come. But you know that God is carrying out the plan of redemption on time, just like he said from the very beginning of creation. Nothing has changed. Look what the Bible says. It goes on to say, verse 5. For this. They willingly are ignorant of that by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water. And where else? It's talking about the flood. Verse six, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. In fact, the word of God told us that there was going to come a flood to destroy that world. Then the Bible says in verse seven, but the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word are kept in store, reserved into fire against the day of what? judgment and perdition of what and then verse 8 says look at this verse 8 let's read that together it says but beloved be not ignorant of what in other words if you forgot everything else it says don't forget this be not ignorant of this one thing that one day is with the lord how as a thousand years and a thousand years as what so now my brothers and sisters if man has six days to do his work in one day the rest, and man was made in the image of God, then God has six days or six what? Thousand years to do his work, and then one day or one thousand years to rest in the work that he has done. Now, my brothers and sisters, this is why God is going to finish his work of redemption in six thousand years of saving man. And everybody's going to be saved or be taken to heaven at the end of six thousand. And in heaven, we're going to be there how long? How long? For a thousand years. And then the plan of redemption is going to come to an end. Now, my brothers and sisters, do you know then that means then that the generation that comes to the 6,000 years or the end of the day of atonement is not the first generation, but the final generation. The 6,000 years is the boundary. The 6,000 years is the limit. The 6,000 years is how we would recognize if the earth is getting ready to reach the final generation and that its time of lasting has come due and that the limit is over. Now, what we have to do is go back and see this. Now, this says God made man in his what? Child guidance 103. It says from the first dawn of reason, the human mind should become intelligent in regard to the physical structure. Here, Jehovah has given a what? Specimen of himself. Now, does anybody know what a specimen is? What's a specimen? A sample. If you had anybody in the medical profession, when someone takes your blood, they're taking a what? Specimen. Now, when they take your blood, are they taking everything or just a little bit of it? I pray they're only taking a specimen. If they take all your blood, you're dead. Am I right? So now, my brothers and sisters, a specimen is a small piece of a larger part. And you can know the larger part by looking at the little part. So now, my brothers and sisters, it says Jehovah has given a specimen of himself in humankind, in, the, in man. Why? For man was made in the image of in other words, if you want to understand God, all you have to do is study what? Man. For man was made in his image. 
Well, what do we find out was how much time that man had? Talk to me, somebody. Man had what? Man had six days to do his work and one day to rest, which equals what? Seven. And so that means that God also has seven days. But as we study from the Bible, a day is with the Lord as a what? Thousand years. So that God is going to finish everything in seven thousand years. Now, brother and sister, what you can call this is the great week of time. Can you count to seven? Count to seven with me. Two, three, what else? Four, five, six, seven. You can count to seven, we can understand the final generation. That's the duration of the 7,000 year period. We look at that and we can begin to recognize that Eden was lost at the beginning of the 7,000 year period and Eden is going to be restored at the end. 6,000 years of work, 1,000 years of rest. Remember when Jesus said, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day, for the night cometh when no man can work. My brothers and sisters, we look at the text that begin to show us this. Now it's amazing that something happened at the end of the 4,000 year period. At the end of the 4,000 year period, it says it was God's purpose to place things on an eternal basis of security. And in the council of heaven, it was decided that time must be given for Satan to develop the principles which were the foundation of his government. It says the plan of redemption was put in operation for how long? For what? 4,000 years, Christ was working for man's uplifting and Satan for his ruin and what else? Degradation. We saw for 4,000 years, it says Christ was standing at the point of transition between two economies. And there are two great festivals. He, the spotless lamb of God, was about to present himself as a sin offering that he would thus bring to the end the system of types and ceremonies that for how long, talk to me, for what? 4,000 years had pointed to his death. So when Jesus died on the cross, about how much time had passed by? About what? 4,000 years. Then the cross took place. Then, my brothers and sisters, that tells me how much time was left after Jesus died on the cross. About, about how much time? Talk to me. If you had 4,000, and 6,000 is the limit about how much time was left. That's why Satan says, when, the, when, when, when Jesus cast them out, he said, have you come to destroy me before the, he knew that he had 6,000 years. He said, you came before the time. Now, when you get the 6,000 years, what's going to happen at the end of 6,000 years is that that's the limit for Jesus to come out of the most holy place on time, and then he's going to go take us to heaven, and we're going to be there how long? A 1,000 years, and this is going to make up that 7,000 year period, and then Eden lost will become Eden restored. Now, my brothers and sisters, when Satan died on the, uh, when Jesus died on the cross, Satan knew that he had a short what? Now, someone said, well, how did he know that? What, 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 what would make that say that? But let's put days of the week to this for a moment and recognize that. The first thousand year period will be what? Sunday. The second thousand year period will be what? Monday. The third thousand year period will be what? Tuesday. The fourth thousand year period will be what? That means, brothers and sisters, you look at that, then the, 5,000 year period would be what? Thursday. The 6,000 year period would be what? That means, you know, just as the sun sets on time and the Sabbath comes, do you know that the Sabbath is a type of the coming of Jesus? That if we will not be ready for the coming of the Lord at sunset, we will not be ready when Jesus comes the second time. If we're still at Walmart, still, uh, still trying to get gas and put in our car, it shows us that we're not going to make it. I mean, think about it. If, if you were failing a test every week at school and then you came to the final exam, what would make you think you're going to pass the final exam if we've been failing every quiz all year long? Every Sabbath, God's given us a test. My brother says, this should make it in my mind. From this Sabbath on, we're going to be ready when sun sets. Amen? Jesus is going to come on time. Now, my brother and sister, do you know that Jesus came at the 4,000 year period, he was conducting something very special. What do we do on Wednesday normally? We have what? Prayer meeting. Do you know that Jesus was conducting prayer meeting when he came to this earth at the 4,000 year period? When is the next time that you come back together after prayer meeting to have Friday Vesper service? You remember early Adventists used to talk about Friday Vesper service, and it happens on time. Now, my brothers and sisters, this is the great, great week of time. And do you know that every Seventh-day Adventist used to believe what we're talking about right now? And the question is, in 2023, how close are we to this 6,000-year limit? Do you want to know, yes or no? Are you sure? All right. Look at this, brothers and sisters. We'll go a little further. How old is the earth? 
How old is the earth? All the world were basically unified until the theory of evolution. Everybody in the world, it didn't matter what your persuasion was, until the theory of evolution, which is really a new theory, way back in, the, in, in 1844, just a couple hundred years. Now, brethren and sisters, between 1996 and 2004, the earth reached 6,000 years. Did you hear what I said? Between 1996 and 2004, the earth reached 6,000 years. This is common understanding. There used to be a man by the name of Usher. He was a very well-known, Usher was a very well-known historian, scholar. He knew all this, and he, he went through the Bible, and he put history in the Bible and linked them all together. Now, my brother and sister, I want to ask you a question. Why would I spend all this time showing us that God does everything on time? He was born on, he resurrected on, he died on, he came, he's going to come back the second time on. Why would he do all this on time? And I just tell you now that 6,000 years have already passed for the earth. Now, my brother and sister, the earth is 6,000 years old, but we didn't have 6,000 years from creation. Do you know that from creation, we could have lived forever. If Adam and Eve had never sinned, they could have eaten from the tree of life, and they could have lived how long? How long? When did the limit begin to be set on the earth? The limit was not set until man was until man introduced sin into the world. The wages of sin is death or a limit. So, my brothers and sisters, what we have to find out is not how long the earth was only, but how long has sin been in this earth? So, my question is, what year did sin start on the earth? We don't know. And so we would never be able to get to the exact day and hour with the 6,000 year understanding of the limit. But we can get to the generation. We're going to prove that. Now, my brothers and sisters, this shows us something very clear and careful. This says time is what? Almost finished. Do you reflect the lovely image of Jesus as you should? Then I was pointing to the earth and saw that there would have to be a getting ready among those who have late embraced the Third angel's message said the angel, get ready, get ready, get ready. Why? You will have to die a greater death to the world than you have what? Ever yet died. Let's read that last sentence together. It says, I saw that there was what? A great work to do for them and but what? Little time in which to do it. Now, my brothers and sisters, many things we can study in the sanctuary. Many things we can study in the plan of redemption. But there's only two that is of the utmost importance. That two thing is this. Write this down on your notes, please. Great work. Number one. And little time. Number two. Inspiration tells us those two things. It says, look at the last sentence. It says, I saw there was what? A great what? Work to do for them. And but what? Little time and what should do it. Now, my brothers and sisters, are those the same two things Jesus was focused on? Yes or no? Do you remember what Jesus said in John 9, verse 4? You see, when you start reading the Bible, you see layers come off, and you say, I understand now. Everything this prophet says, the Bible says, Jesus in the plan of redemption, he said, in John 9, verse 4, he said, I must what? Work the work of him that sent me while it is day. Why? For the night cometh when no man can work. What was Jesus doing? He was saying, I must work great work. Of him that sent me while it sent me, uh, uh, while it is day. Day is talking about what? Talk to me. He's talking about what? Time. For the night coming when no man can work, Jesus was looking at great work and little time. So my brothers and sisters, these are the two things that we must understand. Number one, we must understand the time of the sanctuary or the time of redemption. Number two, we must understand the work of redemption or the work of the sanctuary. Now, today we have found out very clearly what the time of redemption is, the whole thing. How much time does God place to the complete history of redemption? How much time? No, 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 don't whisper to me. We just, we just start from the Bible. Talk to me, brothers and sisters. How long? For the whole plan of redemption. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. 7,000 years. Then that 7,000 is broken up into two parts. What are the two parts? Six and one. 6,000 and 1,000. We saw that. Now, brothers and sisters, do you know that every seven Adventists used to believe what I'm telling you right now? I'm going to let you see this for a moment. I'm blowing this up. You can see it. This is coming from Jane Andrews. It says, many today see significance 
in the, I'm going to jump down to the last uh, paragraph and last sentence. It says, in his sixth article, Jane Andrews stated the same concept. Let's read what Jane Andrews said. Jane Andrews is the man that they made Andrews University, at, named Andrews University after. And let's read this together. It says, after seven of these weeks of years came the year what? Jubilee. In this year, liberty was proclaimed throughout all the land to all its inhabitants, and every man returned to his own inheritance. This signifies that after the great Sabbath, during which the earth will remain what? Uncultivated for 1,000 years, the great week of 7,000 years being finished, the curse will cease after having consumed the earth with all who are wicked. Then the earth will be created anew by the power of God, and all the just will return to their inheritance where? In the new earth, and never know sin nor sorrow where? Do you know we've proved that from the word of God? Every seven Adventists used to believe this. In fact, we used to sing about it. You used to be in our hymnals. You remember there used to be a song that we sung called Holy Day, Jehovah's Rest. Remember that song? It will be wonderful if we still had that in our hymnal today. Now I'm going to blow up the fourth, the fourth line. The fourth line actually says something very interesting. It says, all who speak the truth must say. It was, now we say man, but you know, it used to say it was the Pope who changed it. They were plain. It was the Pope who changed the day. In God's word, no change appears through the whole 6,000 years. Every seven day Adventist used to believe this. But we have lost our identity. We have developed spiritual amnesia and have lost the distinctive message that God has given us. But tonight, he wants to bring it back. What do you say? So now, my brothers and sisters, this is what we have lost that we've got to get back. This is why God is bringing us back to the word of God. And we can see very clearly that time of redemption. We need to see how close we are. But before we do that, I'm going to take these next few minutes, before we bring out some final points, I'm going to take these next few minutes to tell us something that we have not been talked about before. And that is, we know there's a time of redemption, but we have not studied about the work of redemption. You see, brothers and sisters, not only should we understand the time, but we need to understand that there is a work that is to be done in that time. And once we understand how or what this work is, we will see why Jesus had a spirit of urgency. I saw that there was a great work to do for them and but little time in which to do it. What is this great work of redemption? What is this great work of the sanctuary? Go with me in your Bible to the book of Leviticus. What book did I say? Now we'll come back and we're going to find out how close are we to that limit. We're going to come back and close on that, but I want to look at this for a moment. Look at Leviticus 25. We see the time of redemption, but what we want to do for the next few minutes is spend some time looking at the work of redemption before we bring it to a close. Look what the Bible says in Leviticus chapter 25. We know that the burden of the passage of this book is the unfolding of this plan of redemption. God symbolized the work of redemption under the symbol of two things in the sanctuary, under the symbol of a lamb and under the symbol of a priests. We find, brothers and sisters, there are three places in the sanctuary. What are the three places that we studied about from the first night? There is the outer court. There is the holy place. There is the most holy place. Three places, but only two works. What are the two works? They're represented by the work of the lamb and by the work of the priest. And someone says, well, how could there be three places and only two works? Well, I want to say it this way. The work in the outer court is the work of the lamb. The work in the holy place is the work of the priest. The work in the most holy place is the work of the priest. So though there are three places, only two different works. Represented by the lamb and the priest. Question. What was the work of the lamb? And what is the work of the priest? The Bible says, the first, who is the lamb? Who is the lamb? Remember when John the Baptist saw Jesus, he said, behold the Lamb of God, which take away the sin of the world, John 1, 29. Who is the priest? Jesus. The Bible says in Hebrews 4, 14 through 16, it says, seeing that Jesus has passed into the heavens, our great high priest, Jesus is lamb and priest. He's alpha and omega. The sanctuary is a revelation of Jesus Christ from beginning to end. Now, my brothers and sisters, this shows us the work that Jesus has done. Let's see the work of the lamb in Leviticus 25. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. 
In Leviticus chapter 25, notice what the Bible says in Leviticus 25, beginning in verse 51. In Leviticus 25, beginning in verse 51, let's read that together. Notice what the Bible says in verse 51. The Bible says, if there be yet many years behind, according unto them, he shall give again the price of his redemption. Now, I want to ask you a question. What then was the work of the Lamb? What was the work of the Lamb? When Jesus died on the cross, what was he doing? He was paying the price for the sin of the world. This was the work of redemption. The Bible says, for the, in verse 51 it says, unto them shall he give again the price of his, what? Redemption. Out of the money that he was bought for. Question, is the purpose of paying a price just to pay a price? Or is there a reason to pay a price? When you go to a store and you buy something, do you just give the clerk the money and then leave out the store? Or do you get something after you give the money? We wouldn't be intelligent. Can you imagine you bought something from the store? You go in, you pay your money, and you leave out the store. Some say you forgot something. <laughs> the purpose of paying the price is so that something can be accomplished. So what was the work of the lamb was not simply paying the price. The price was to purchase something. It was to cause you and I to be what? Talk to me, somebody. To be what? When he died on the cross, it was so that we could be something very specific. When he died on the cross, it was so that we could be bought. And I praise God. But in 31 AD, Jesus bought every sinner that no matter how many sins we committed, he purchased all of them. And Jesus, for that price paid, made it possible for you and me to be saved. You know, no matter how many sins we committed, if we come to Jesus, that Jesus has purchased our sins, this is the plan of redemption. And my brothers and sisters, is this the end of the redemption? This is only the beginning. The first work of redemption is that the lamb was to bought us. I know that's not right language, but I want you to understand what I'm saying. The first work of redemption is so that we could be bought by the lamb. What's the final work of redemption by the priest? What must happen by the priest? Yes, Jesus did his work as a lamb, and someone says the work is finished. Do you know that every other denomination believes the work is finished because they believe everything ended at the cross? Well, didn't Jesus say? At the cross, his last three words were, it is. What was finished at the cross? The work of redemption? What was finished at the cross? The work of the first part or the work of the lamb? At the work of the lamb, the first part of redemption was done. And in other words, we were bought. But when his work as a lamb was done, his work as a priest had just begun. Now, I like that. You like that? When his work as a lamb was done, his work as a priest was just begun. Now, my brothers and sisters, what is the work of the priest? Someone says to make an atonement. I want us to see from the word of God, Leviticus chapter 25 tells us both. And number one, verse 51 says we were bought. But in verse 55, it shows the last part of the work of redemption. In Leviticus chapter 25, verse 55, let's read that together. What does the Bible say in verse 55? It says, for unto me the children of Israel are what? Are servants. They are my servants whom not I bought, but they are my servants whom I what? Brought forth out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your what? Now, brothers and sisters, the first thing it says that man was bought, but the second work is that man must be what? Brought. Is there a difference between being bought and being brought? One is a price paid. The other suggests that a move is made. We'll move somewhere. You know, it's possible to buy something but not bring it. Now, my brothers and sisters, my question is, where does the priest want to bring us? He wants to bring us in the most holy place. But to bring us in the most holy place, he has to bring us to a particular experience with Jesus Christ. In fact, go to Hebrews 6. It tells us where he wants to bring us. Go to Hebrews chapter 6. What book did I say? We're going to Hebrews now. We're not making up one word. We're letting the Bible explain itself. It's a wonderful thing when everything we believe is in the word of God. Look what the Bible says in the book of Hebrews chapter 6. The Bible tells us that the work of the Lamb was that we must be bought. He did that in 31 AD. And the work of the priest is that we must be brought, but brought where? Go with me in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 6. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. Notice what the prophet says. I'm going to read it here first. Education, page 15. Let's read that together. It says, 
to restore in man the image of his maker, to bring him back, back where, back where, talk to me somebody, to bring him back to the perfection in which he was, what, created to promote the development of body, watch the plug, my friend, to promote the, body, the development of body, mind, and soul that the divine purpose in his creation might be realized, this was to be the work of redemption. This is the object of education. This is the great object of life. What is the work of redemption? That man must not only be bought, but he must be brought. Brought where? Brought where? Back to perfection. Now, my brothers and sisters, the work of Jesus in that sanctuary is to bring us back to perfection. Now, I know that there's new theology today that says that a sinner can never be brought back to perfection. But that's not the work of the sanctuary. That's not the work of the gospel. That's not the message of Jesus Christ. Jesus says that he has power to give us victory over every sin. Why do we write songs about it if we don't believe it? You remember that song? Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's what? Power in the blood. Power in the blood. Would you over evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. Is there power in the blood of Jesus? Yes or no? What sin is more powerful than Jesus? Is an evil temper more powerful than Jesus? Is appetite more powerful than Jesus? Is selfishness more powerful than Jesus? Is pride. What sin can you name me that's more powerful than Jesus? Someone says, well, I smoke, I drink, I sin, I fornicate. But brothers and sisters, nothing is more powerful than Jesus Christ. And God is trying to demonstrate to the universe for the vindication of his character that his blood has enough power to give us victory over every sin. This is the work of the sanctuary. Now, my brothers and sisters, that means that by the time that the sanctuary closes at the limit of 6,000 years, he must have a generation that is brought back to perfection. You know what that means? If we're nearing the limit, what do we look like right now? If we'll be honest with each other, behind closed doors, we don't look like Jesus. That means that if probation will close right now, we're not just waiting for the limit to come. We're not just waiting for, uh, for, for the end. We're, there's a work that must happen right now, but guess what? That work has not happened inside of us yet. That work is not simply paying tithes. That work is not simply coming to church. That work is developing a relationship with Jesus where he can bring us back to biblical perfection. Someone says, well, that's what the prophet says, but the Bible didn't say that. Listen, everything that prophet says, the Bible says. Do you believe that? More than you almost a seven day Adventist. Now listen, everything that that Bible says, the prophet says, and everything that prophet says, the Bible says. We saw that the work of the priest was not only to be bought, but to be brought, but brought where? Look what the Bible says in Hebrews 6. You're there, amen? Hebrews chapter 6, first, first verse. Where are we going? Where is he going to bring us? Where does the priest want to bring us? Hebrews 6 verse 1 says, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go. Well, where is he going to bring us? Let us go on into perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and faith toward God. Talk to me, somebody. Where does Jesus want to bring us according to this verse? He wants to bring us back to where? perfection, everything that the prophet says, the Bible says. You know, the sanctuary, the great purpose of the sanctuary is to show the work of Jesus as priest, as lamb. It shows the results of that sanctuary service. The book of Hebrews focuses on the sanctuary and the service, and the result is he wants to bring us back to perfection. Now, my brothers and sisters, look what the prophet says. Concerning this, inspiration tells us, it says in red, it is, it, it, and the first sentence says, the tempest agency is not to be accounted as an excuse for one wrong act. Satan is jubilant when he hears the professed followers of Christ making excuses for their deformity of character. I'm only human. Well, if we're only human, we're not Christians. For if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away and all things become new. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. It is these excuses that lead to sin. There is what? No excuse for sinning. Why? Because there's power in the blood of Jesus. Someone says, what if I sin? Well, if we sin, we have an advocate. We have a priest that can forgive us our sin, but the plan of redemption must do more than forgive us of sin. It must bring us back to perfection, brothers and sisters. 
And if he cannot bring us back to perfection, then Satan is right. But I praise God that he's not right. And God is going to have a generation that proves him wrong. What do you say? Now, my brothers and sisters, inspiration tells us that this is what it means. This is what it means. It says, he who does not abhor himself cannot understand the meaning of what? Redemption. Now, let's read this sentence together. It says, to be redeemed means what? To cease. So what if I have, what does cease mean? What does cease mean? So then that means that in order for, if I'm redeemed, I stop sinning. So then if I'm still sinning, I have not fully been redeemed. You know, we sing, I've been redeemed. But no, 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 no. Redemption brings us back to a place where we stop sinning. Someone says, are you sure about that? Do you know that the Bible says the exact words? Go to 1 Peter. Let me show you 1 Peter. You're in Hebrews. Go to the, a few chapters over, a few books over. 1 Peter chapter 1. We're going to see the whole story of this redemption plan in 1 Peter 1. That's the whole burden of the Bible. In 1 Peter chapter 1, and when you get there, let me know by saying amen. 1 Peter chapter 1, isn't it a wonderful thing when everything we believe is in the word of God? Yes or no? It's wonderful, brothers and sisters. All seven day Adventism is, is the religion of the Bible. Look what the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 18. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. 1 Peter 1, verse 18, let's read that together. It says, for as much as that you were not redeemed with what? Corruptible things as silver and what? Talking about the redemption plan. From your vain conversation, received by tradition from your fathers, then what were we redeemed with? If it wasn't money or gold, what were we redeemed with? Something more viable with the precious blood of what? Jesus. Look at the next verse. Verse 19 says, you were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ. How? As of a lamb without blemish and without spots. Now remember? First work of redemption is the work of the lamb. That work bought us. Well, what's the next work of redemption? That the priest must what? Talk to me, somebody. Brought us, brought us where? Back to per. Does the Bible say so? Look at 1 Peter 3. Go to 1 Peter 3 now. 1 Peter 1 said, as a lamb, he bought us. He redeemed us. He paid the price. 1 Peter 3 says that that same lamb, that same Christ as a priest is going to bring us. First bought in chapter 1, and notice verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 18. 1 Peter 3, verse 18. What does the Bible say in verse 18? It says, for what? For Christ also have one suffered. How? For sins. The just for the unjust. That he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but what? Quickened in the spirit. Did you notice what it said? In verse 18 it said, for Christ also suffered for us, the just for the unjust. Why? Why? That he might what? Bring us to God. So in chapter 1, he bought us. In chapter 3, he did what? Brought us, or he brought us. What is he going to do? Where is he going to bring us? Chapter 4 tells us where he's going to bring us. Now follow what we just did. Chapter 1 tells us Jesus bought us. Chapter 3 tells us that he brought us. Chapter 4 is going to tell us where he wants to bring us. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1, notice what the Bible says in 1 Peter 4 and verse 1, it says, For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise, how? With the same mind. For he that has suffered in the flesh hath what? Ceased from sin. So where does God want to bring us? By giving us his mind, he wants to bring us to a place where we can do what? Cease from sin. Now, is that not the exact words of the pen of inspiration? Inspiration says to be redeemed means to what? Cease from sin. Everything that the prophet says, the Bible says here, word for word, Christ wants to give us his mind. He said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Do you know that if we have the mind of Christ, we will cease from sin by the power of the indwelling Christ. I can do all things through Christ who does what? Strengthens me. And my brothers and sisters, this is the place that God wants to bring us, to a place that we can cease from sin. Do you know that this is the work of the priest? In fact, look what the prophet says. This is one of the most powerful quotations. And all the writings of the spirit of prophecy on this point from Signs of the Time, July 23rd, 1902. Let's read it together. Not just one person, but 100% of people who follow Jesus can get this experience. Let's read it together. It says, how many? Everyone who believes where? 
on Christ. How many? Everyone who relies not on themselves. We can't do this in our own strength. But everyone who relies on the what? On the keeping power of a what? Risen Savior. That has suffered the penalty pronounced upon the transgressor. That's the work of the Lamb. Everyone who resists temptation and in the midst of evil copies the pattern given him in the Christ life will through faith in the atoning sacrifice of Christ become a partaker of what? Talk to me somebody. The divine nature. We are new creatures in Christ Jesus. It says, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through what? Now look at that last sentence. Let's read it together. It says, everyone, not just one, but everyone who by faith does what? Obeys God's commandments will reach a condition of sinlessness in which Adam lived before his transgression. That's the plan of redemption. That's the message of the sanctuary. That's the message of the Bible. That's the message of the three angels. That's the message of seven-day Adventism. That's the message that the devil has tried to, be de has to try to destroy so that he can stop the work of Jesus inside that most holy place. But my brothers and sisters, in this last generation, God is going to get a sinless generation. Do you know that this is the last thing that must take place before Jesus can leave the most holy place on time? Now, my brother and sister, someone says, what if Jesus could not do this? What if Jesus could not bring the people of God to this place? I ask this question this way. What would happen if God could not bring us back to perfection and give us victory over sin? Now, I want to make it very plain because, you know, we live in a generation people try to fuss things up. You know, the, the devil will trick us with a lot of type of high sounding scholarly words. I remember one place I was doing a meeting like this. And there was some professor at one of our institutions that told one of the members that were coming out to the meeting, they said, well, it doesn't matter what that minister says. I have my Ph.D., my graduate degrees in language and, 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 and Greek and Hebrew, and so he doesn't know what he's telling you. I'm telling you there's no such thing because when you talk of perfection, do what he says. When you talk of perfection, there are many types of perfection. Telos perfection, Greek perfection, Hebrew perfection. Total perfection. What's perfection? What are you talking about? And so the person came back to me confused at the next meeting. And I said, listen, I'm not trying to condemn a professor, but we must line everything up to the word of God, to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, no light. And I said, what I want you to do, I said, I want to make it very simple. I don't get into tell us perfection, per, to subject perfection, per, per, perpendicular perfection. I said, all you need to ask is about biblical perfection. Biblical perfection, very simple. Any, a child can understand biblical perfection. Well, what is biblical perfection? Well, this is biblical perfection. Is God perfect, yes or no? God is perfect. When God made man, how did God make man? In his own what? Image. So what were we when God made us? Perfect. Now, there's only one thing that happened to man that made him imperfect, that marred the character of God. What was that? Sin. And so if sin destroyed perfection, then there's only one thing that can make a man be brought back to perfection. You must take away sin. So biblical perfection is the removing of sin from the heart and life and the record of the believer. You must bring him back to sinlessness where he has victory over his sin by the power of the indwelling Christ. He said, well, that makes sense. I said, that's Bible. Now, my brothers and sisters, you and I must come to the place where we understand it and we cannot let anything trick us. Can you imagine a man came in today and you came in? In fact, let me ask you a question. You drove today here? What color car did you have? He had a blue car. Now, can imagine now. He had a blue car. He saw it. Imagine if I came in and said, well, you know, my brother, you came here in a blue car. You think it's blue. But I have my Ph.D. in colors. That color blue is really a neon purple. It's a pink. What would you say? Well, you know, I, I guess I didn't see things right. You have your Ph.D. Is that what you say? There are things that are simple that the common man can understand for himself. And the Bible says, study to show thy self approval to God, a workman that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Second Timothy 2 Timothy 2.15. Now, my brothers and sisters, the reason why Satan does not want us to understand this is because he knows that if Jesus cannot be successful and bringing us back to perfection, something happens in the great controversy. Now, my brothers and sisters, all we got to do is look at it. Now, how many plan of redemptions are there? One plan or three plans? Just one. 
So then the three parts are not three different plans. They're three parts of one plan. Does that make sense? So if I can show you what would have happened if the first part of the plan of redemption failed, then you will know what would have happened if the second part failed. You would know what would have happened if the third part failed because it's all part of the same plan. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Now, what would have happened if the first part failed? Because there are three parts to this wonderful plan of redemption in the outer court, in the holy place, and inside the most holy place. The work begins in the outer court. It finishes in the most holy place. This is the work that God has laid for us. Now, what would have happened if the work had failed? Look what it says in early writings, page 157. It says, Satan presented before Jesus the kingdoms of the world in the most attractive light. I'm jumping down. If the plan of salvation should have been carried out and Jesus should die to redeem man, Satan knew that the owner, that his own power must be what? Limited and finally taken away and that he would be destroyed. Now, let's read that next part. It says, therefore, it was what? His study plan, talking about the devil, to prevent, if possible, the completion of the great work which had been commenced by the Son of God. Let's read that together. If the plan of man's redemption should fail, Satan would retain the kingdom which he then claimed. And if he should succeed, he flattered himself that he would reign in opposition to the God of what? So if the plan of redemption had failed, Satan would have retained possession of the earth and humanity would have been under his control until there would have been an eternal ruin and loss for the human race. But he wouldn't have stopped there. You know, he planned on something else. If he had failed, the great controversy would have been lost. And this is what Jesus understood in the Garden of Gethsemane. Desire of Ages 690. I'm only going to read the underline so you can see what it says. But now the history of the human race comes up before the world's redeemer. He sees that the transgression of the law is if left to themselves must what? Look at the next line. It says the woes and lamentations of a doom rise before him. He will save man at any cost to him what? Next line says, and he will not turn from his mission. He will become the propitiation of a race that has willed to sin. His prayer now breathes only submission. If this cup may not pass from me except I drink it, thy will be what? You remember this was in the Garden of Gethsemane in Matthew 26. Jesus could not go to sleep. His disciples were sleeping, but what kept Jesus was awake? What kept Jesus awake was that he understood the great work that had to be done. Zion 6.93. The world's unfallen. The heavenly angels have watched with intense interest as the conflict drew to a close. Satan in his unconfederacy of evil, the legions of apostasy, watched intently this great crisis in the work of... But redemption has three parts. You will find in every place there's a crisis. There's a crisis in the outer court. There's a crisis in the holy place, and there's a crisis in the most holy place. That's why in the most holy place it's called the final crisis. But you couldn't have a final crisis unless you had a crisis before that. Now this says, look at it in the next line, it says, no way of escape could be found for the Son of God in this awful crisis when everything was at stake. How much was at stake? When the mysterious cup trembled in the hand of the sufferer, then the heaven opened up. Next line says, the angel came not to take the cup from Christ's hand, but to strengthen him to drink it with the assurance of the Father's what? Love. Brothers and sisters, this is where Jesus was sweating great drops of blood in Gethsemane. He understood how much was at stake. Look what it says. As Christ felt his unity with the Father broken up, he feared that in his human nature, he will be unable to endure the coming conflict. In the wilderness of temptation, the destiny of the human race had been at stake. Christ was then conqueror. Now the tempter had come for the last fearful struggle. For this he had been preparing during the three years of Christ's ministry. Let's read this together. Everything was what? At stake with him. Next line, or the next underline, it says, but if Christ could be what? Overcome. The earth would become Satan's kingdom. And the human race would be forever in his power. With the issue of the conflict before him, Christ's soul was filled with dread of separation from God. He recognized, if I fail in the plan of redemption, the universe becomes Satan. Now, my brothers and sisters, that's what would have happened if he failed in phase one. Then what would have happened if he fails in phase two? Same thing. And what would happen if he failed in phase three? That means that the great controversy is not over right now. Satan feels that he can still win. And I'm going to tell you something. He can win by TKO. 
You know what a TKO is? A technical knockout. You know, it's possible that Satan can win by a technicality. He could never defeat Jesus powerfully with his arms, but he knows that Jesus is faithful to his word. Now, I'm not going to let you think about this for a long time because it's a sad thought, but do you know what would have happened if Christ had failed? Exactly the reverse of what's going to happen for Satan for a thousand years. Satan was left in a desolate earth with nothing there but dead corpses all around him. But Jesus would be there not for a thousand years, but Jesus has what type of life inside of himself? Eternal life. He would be in a desolate wilderness for eternal life, and he would never create anything again because God is faithful whether you look at him or not. But praise God, that's not going to happen. And the reason why it's not going to happen is because God is going to get somebody that has victory over sin. You and I must understand that this is the work of redemption and no other church understands this. Everybody believes it was ended at the cross except for Seventh-day Adventists. But let me tell you today, many of us are now believing that it all ended at the cross because we don't understand this message of the sanctuary, the plan of redemption. But as we get ready to close, I want us to understand something. Go in your Bible to Leviticus 16. What book did I say? Let's go to Leviticus 16 because God showed all this in type. In type, God showed all this in type. And I want to show you this. You remember, when was the first hint that God showed us that all this is going to take place? What was the hint that God showed us all this is going to take place? When was the first time that God hinted that he was going to defeat the devil and he was going to finish the work and defeat the devil? What, when did he first hint at this? Genesis 3.15. Now, let me see if you remember Genesis 3.15. I love this, brothers and sisters. Let's read it together. And well, not, we're not reading it there. <laughs> Let's repeat it together. And I will put what? Enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his. Now, we're going to see if you understand that verse as we come to these last few moments of our study tonight. We're going to see. Now, this says, ever since his fall, Satan has been at work to establish himself as ruler of the earth. He saw the sacrificial offerings, which have been ordained to represent Christ as dying for the race, and he tried in every possible way to so pervert them that the people would lose sight of their true meaning. Did he do his job well, yes or no? Look at this last sentence. From the Jewish age down to the what? Present time. That's, and this is written March 9, 1886, in Review and Herald. But guess what? It's still true today, even more so. It says Satan work. Uh, it says Satan's warfare has been uh, down to our time, the present time. Satan's warfare has been directed against two things. Number one, against the what? Son of God. But he can't touch him anymore. But Jesus, Jesus died, victorious, resurrected, victorious, went back to heaven, victorious, caught up, and now Satan can't touch him up there. But woe unto the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. So now, where does he turn his work? He turns from Jesus and now turns to what? His work. What was his work? Remember the time of redemption? Work of redemption. Work as a lamb, that's done. But what's he doing now? The work of the priest, which is the work of bringing us back to perfection. Are you with me? And he, that is Satan, still flatters himself that he will obtain the victory. Satan still believes he's going to win. Someone says, oh, you fool. Don't you know that it all finished at the cross? But my brother and sisters, do you know why Satan flatters himself that he will attain the victory? Because of you and me. In order for Jesus to win, somebody has to get victory over sin. And Satan says, look at us. We're sinning still, playing around, watching whatever we want, eating what we want, doing what we want, thinking what we want, and saying, I don't care. I'm going to still follow my own and hold on to my cherished sins. But there stands Jesus saying, please, my character is on the line. I want to vindicate his character. What do you say? Now, my brothers and sisters, this is what must happen in the most holy place, and this is the issue that is now at stake. Satan's head must be what? Crushed. Do you see that? Watch his head. I'm going to pull on. Pow! 
Let me back that up. How? Now, you know, you, know, you got to get excited about this thing. Now, think about it now. You, you, ever, you ever seen it? I mean, years ago, you used to watch sports. You remember that somebody did a, a crossover, knocked somebody down, or dunked on him? You know what they did? The, the sports casters, what did they do? They replay that thing. Didn't they replay it? They did it over and over. Before the commercial, they did it three or four times. This is what we need to replay. This is the real drama. <laughs> Satan's afraid of this. This is what he's most afraid of because when his head is crushed, sin and sinners will be no more. You know what someone says? Someone says, well, I thought his head was already crushed. Go to Romans 16. We'll close it. We'll come back to Leviticus 16. Go to Romans uh, uh, 16. I want to make sure you see this from the word of God. Word of God. Romans 16. Go there quickly. I only have a few minutes left. I'm getting ready to close. Go to Romans 16. Quickly, quickly. Romans 16. Now, when, I'm testing you now. When did Jesus crush the head of the serpent? Now, if you talk to every denomination, they will tell you that this prophecy reached a fulfillment in 31 A.D. They say, look at it. When Jesus died on the cross, what was the place called that, where, where Jesus died? What, what was the mountain called? Mount Golgotha. Do you know what Golgotha means? The place of a fall. And there, Jesus died on the cross. Someone says, then he said his last three words, it is what? So they said, surely his head was crushed. Now, you know, every seven Adventists used to believe that. Everybody used to, every Christian church used to believe that until the message of seven Adventism, which is the message of the Bible, really opened up before us. Somebody says, what do you mean? You see, at the cross, you want to find out, began the crushing of the head. Didn't finish it. It started the work, but didn't finish it. So I said, how are you so sure? I thought it finished. But let's look at the Bible. Romans 16. Now, who wrote, who wrote the book of Romans? The Apostle Paul. Was this before the cross or after the cross? After the cross. Now, watch what he says in Romans 16, after the cross. Romans 16, verse 20. Let's read that together. The Bible says, and the God of what? Peace. Shall do what? Bruise Satan where? Under your feet where? Shortly, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Now, question. What tense does the Apostle Paul put the bruising or crushing of Satan's head, past, present, or future? Future. It says the God of peace shall bruise. Future. This is after the cross. After the cross, the Bible says Satan's head must still be bruised and crushed, which tells me it didn't finish at the cross. Now, my brothers and sisters, my question is, when will Jesus come back and finish the work of bruising Satan's head? What he did at the cross, he said, look, after he left the resurrection, he said, that was part one. You come back, I'm going to finish this in a little while. Now, my brothers and sisters, when will this work be finished? We're going back to Leviticus 16. That's where we're going to close there. Go back to Leviticus 16. When will Jesus bruise and finally finish his work. Talk to me, somebody. Watch it now. That word in Romans 16, where it says bruise comes from the word centribal, it means to crush completely. That's for those Greek scholars. Let's go to the first. It finished on the day of atonement. I'm going to see if you see this now. You go into Leviticus 16. What happened on the day of atonement? Inspiration tells us that this brings us down to the closing work, the sanctuary brings us down. It says, in the intercession of Christ and the man's behalf and the sanctuary above is essential to the plan of salvation as was his death where? Upon the cross. By his death, he began that work, which after his resurrection, he ascended to do what? Complete or finish where? In heaven. The cross began the work. But in the sanctuary, he's going to finish the work. This is what God brought us on the scene for, to make this take place. Now, my brothers and sisters, how is he going to do it? When the priest, according to Leviticus 16, on your homework, you read this. In Leviticus 16, beginning in verse 20, let's read it together. Verse 20, now this whole chapter is a day of atonement, but in verse 20, we come to the end 
of the Day of Atonement. Let's read this together. Leviticus 16, verse 20. It says, and when he hath made an end of reconciling the holy place, that is the most holy, and the tabernacle of the congregation, that is the holy place, and the altar, he shall bring the what? Who is the live goat represent? Satan. Verse 21, and Aaron shall lay what? Now, who is Aaron represent? Who is Aaron represent? He's the high priest who represents who? Jesus Christ. And Aaron shall lay his hands. How many of his hands? I wonder why both. We don't have time tonight. Let's go a little further. He shall lay both his hands on the tail of the scapegoat. On the foot of the scapegoat. On the head of the scapegoat. Now, please, tonight, Bethel, I have faith in you tonight that you're going to answer this question correctly. I believe you've been some good students, and I believe you're going to answer this question correctly. So listen carefully. Don't answer too quickly now. Why is the priest in the shadow, in the type, because remember, it must be fulfilled as to the event and as to the time. Why is the priest going to put his hand on the head of the scapegoat rather than on the tail of the scapegoat? I heard you. Praise the Lord. Pastor Minning Hall, they answer right. Because it is the foreshadowing of the final work that was hinted at from the very beginning. That he was going to bruise the serpent's head. It started at the cross, but it's going to be finished on the day of, but not at the beginning of the day of atonement. At the end. So Satan's game plan is to stop the day of atonement from ending on time. Now look at this. How can he stop? Because remember, Jesus can't leave the sanctuary to crush Satan's head with the sin. Now question, what is going to crush the serpent's head? Is it the hand of the priest? All you got to do is look at the lamb. In the shadow the hand was placed on the lamb first, the head of that lamb. And sin was transferred from the sinner through the substitute to that lamb. Now, my brothers and sisters, that was a type of Jesus. Did the nails kill Jesus on the cross? Did the spear kill Jesus? What was it that killed Jesus? It was your sin and my sin, beloved, that killed Jesus. So what is it that's going to destroy Satan is the transfer of sin upon him. Now, my brothers and sisters, this is getting ready to take place, but he can't do that unless he has the sin. Now, how much sin? Look at what it says. In verse 21, it says, and Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the lion, go and confess over him. How much? Verse 21, all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions in what? How much iniquity? How much transgression? How much sin? Or what is iniquity? Sin. What is transgression? And what is sin? So I think he's trying to make it clear all the sin is going to be gone. Now, this sin is coming from the congregation. So then what must the congregation be if all of the sin has been taken from the congregation, then they are less of sin. So the congregation become what? Talk to me, somebody. Sinless. So in the type, in the shadow, at the end of the day of atonement, the priest had a sinless generation. And that was the final generation before Jesus comes. So my brothers and sisters, if Satan can keep the final generation sinning, Jesus cannot come out of the most holy place on time. Now my question is, is the time almost up? Where are we in 2023 of the 6,000 year period? That's our question. Are you ready to do the math? But our time is gone. Tomorrow, we're going to count it up. Remember what the Bible says? The Bible says, here is wisdom. Let him that have understanding count. Now, brothers and sisters, we're going to see that exactly what the historians have said, 
exactly what the scientists have said, exactly what the wise men have said in every field of knowledge, that you and I, the Bible and the spirit of prophecy tell us the exact same thing. Tonight, we have no more time to play. Tonight, if we're honest with God, we have to say, Lord, there is still sin in my life. Do you know that we cannot take sin out of our life by ourselves? We need Jesus. Behold the Lamb of God, which does what? Taketh away the sin of the world. Do you want Jesus to do something that will create a radical change in your life? Do you want Jesus to do something that will take away the sin? Right now, and I'm praying, Lord, dear God, tomorrow when we come back, we're going to put it together, and by the grace of God, we're going to see that if that, that, that how this is going to happen, what God is going to do, and we're going to see our need of having Jesus like never before. We can't do this by ourselves, but we can do all things through Christ who does what? Strengthens us. Do you want Jesus to help you, yes or no? Do you want to be a part of this team? that God is going to use to vindicate his character so that Jesus can come out of the most holy place on time. If that's your desire tonight, I want you to stand where you are and you say, Lord, by standing, I want to help Jesus come out of that most holy place on time. God is going to have somebody ready. And praise God, I want to be one of them. What do you say? God brought these meetings to North Carolina because he knows that God wants to use you. What should a prophet a man to gain the whole world and then lose our souls? I praise God that tonight there's still opportunity. We're going to show you that something is getting ready to come worse than we've ever seen in this world. We're going to show you in the next few months, if God spares our life, we're going to see the most crazy election we've ever seen. We're going to show you that an even worse disease is going to break out on the scene. We're going to show you that a worse political condition of a civil war is going to break out in America and is getting ready to start. We're going to show you that this new Speaker of the House, whose name is what? And you know, Mike Johnson is a Southern Baptist. Someone says, well, I don't mean anything. Well, you know, that should mean something for North Carolina. You know that the greatest religion in North Carolina is the Southern Baptist Convention. We're going to show you that that means something. And we're going to show you that North Carolina had a special work in the Civil War historically. And they're going to have a special work in the, in the Civil War prophetically. Everything is ready but us. My brother and sisters, I'm so glad tonight that God has given you and I an opportunity so that we can get ready for the coming of the Lord. I want to get ready. What do you say? Now, the only way to be ready, we got to be where Jesus is. And Jesus is not in the outer court. He's not in the holy place. You know where Jesus is? Now, to go into the most holy place is going to require a radical change. A radical change. In every part of our lives so that we can be with Jesus. But I don't know about you, but I want to say, I don't care what change has to be made. If I can be with Jesus, if I can be your friend, dear God, I don't care what it is, I'll give it to you. Is that your desire tonight? Praise God. Praise the Lord. Satan did everything tonight to try to stop us, but God brought us here. What do you say? You hung with us. Amen. You hung with us. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that you will be victorious. You will have a sinless generation and you're going to come out of that most holy place on time with the sins of the righteous. And you're going to place them upon the head of the scapegoat on time so that his head can be crushed. And after those sins rest on him for a thousand years, you're going to destroy sin and sinners and turn it into ashes. And then, Lord, upon those ashes, you're going to make a new heaven and a new earth. And Eden lost is going to be Eden restored. And we're going to live happily ever after. And sin will not rise a second time. This is a story of redemption, a story that is almost over tonight. A 
story that is in its final chapter. But Lord, many of us are in the first chapter of our relationship with you. But tonight, we want to know you as a close, intimate, and personal friend. I pause the prayer and I say to someone tonight, You say, Lord, tonight I know that I don't know Jesus. I know there's still sin in my life. I know that there's sins that no one else knows about but Jesus Christ. But you want Jesus to give you victory. I want you just to slip your hand up and say, Lord, give me victory. I want to know Jesus. Heavenly Father, you see every lifted hand. I'm lifting mine because, Lord, I want to know you. I want this experience. Do this for us. Take us home safely tonight and bring us back safely tomorrow where we may go deeper so that we may wake up, clean up, and stand up. We thank you, Father, that we can be your friend tonight. And no matter how many sins we committed, that because of Jesus, we can be saved. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated for a silent moment of meditation. My brothers and sisters, are you happy you're here tonight? Do you want to be ready for the coming of the Lord? Can we see that the handwriting's on the wall? As we get ready to go home tonight reverently, I'm going to ask that we reverently leave out. As the ushers usher us out, we're going to reverently leave, and we're going to be praying tonight, Lord, as we go home. What is in my life that needs to come out? And what is in my life that needs to come in? Amen? That's the prayer we're praying. And we'll see you tomorrow morning, and we're going to pick up here again. May God bless you. As the ushers usher us out, you may consider yourself then dismissed.